And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple. He is a best-selling RPG writer and an award-winning video editor, and is, and is the creator of the upcoming... Our upcoming RPG, Diesel, with its diesel engine, which is fueled by diesel. Sorry, I had to get the triple pun in there. The one and only Steve Stephen Pankatai. How are you doing tonight, man? Hello. Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. Thanks for thanks for coming all the way up to the temple. So, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, as it were. Mm hmm. So with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Oh, geez. Uh, as, a, as a young baby nerd, I, <laughs> I think uh, I started getting into RPGs in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, my, uh, I had a comic shop uh, that had a lot of games and game nights and, and game events, mm -hmm. uh, and I really got into them. Uh, I, I had a few memorable uh, experiences around uh, we would do like an annual relay for life mm -hmm. event where it would be an, an all night event and the comic shop would have a booth and uh, it would be a bunch of nerds sitting together like all night playing games and I think that really just started uh, everything off on a good foot there I can I can I can certainly dig that I can certainly dig that um, were the were the, were there any um? Are there any games in particular you can re you can remember that you ca that you kind of started out with during those high school days? I started big on Call of Cthulhu. Uh, <laughs> I went big into horror right away, uh, and I uh, I would run games for my friends, uh, and uh, we we did a lot of late night games. Uh, we did like a game out in a tent, like playing by like the lamp light. Uh, <laughs> like stuff like that we we got we we went big on like playing by candles and in the dark and at weird times mm -hmm. uh and it it really formed uh, i still play with some of those same people today and it, it really formed a, a strong base for my role-playing experiences mm -hmm. now of, of course i could probably do, there, could, there could probably be a drinking game done be Done. Um, based on how many times you have to you call everybody to do a sand check. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, it, <laughs> a lot of our games were very like there was definitely a horrific element to them, but we were we were kids mm -hmm. basically, you know. So there was a lot of high drinks in them <laughs> as well. Like when when you say when you say yeah. horrific element with high drinks, the the only thing that comes to mind, and maybe it's because of where I come from, is um, Mystery Science Theater, <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> uh, none of us were that funny. <laughs> no, but the, no, but that doesn't stop anybody from trying. That's that's very true. Um, but give, but given that, given that, um, now obviously. Um, Call of Cthulhu is per is percentile based, which is um, a scub topic. I know some people find that to be a bit swingy, but if I, if I'm not mistaken, the current your your uh, diesel project is using a d6 die pool. Mm -hmm. um, what was your introduction to the idea of doing a die pool system instead of a straight percentile roll? Uh, the first. Um... Uh, well, I, I I played Warhammer. <laughs> it was my first introduction to having just a fistful of d6, uh, which is an amazing feeling uh, to just roll like twenty d6s. Uh, but the the one that really clicked it in place for RPGs was uh, I played Die, uh, which is the RPG based on the comic uh, that is is presently out. And it's uh, a transformative role-playing game. If anyone hasn't played it, you absolutely should. Uh, and Diesel uh, takes a, a decent amount of inspiration from it. Uh, it does its own thing, but Die did so much that, to me, was fresh and amazing uh, that it, it opened my eyes in a lot of ways. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and it turns out that the D6 pool system is uh, less swingy in a lot of ways and a lot more predictable than D100 or D20 systems. Uh, so when it came to building a system mechanically, uh, there was a lot to love about it. Yeah. Oh. Now, whenever a D whenever a D six pool is brought up, um, the odds that the odds that the pounds of dice Shadowrun meme is going to get brought up inevitably approaches one with enough time. And would you, with the D six system that you're using, would you say that there's go that you're going with less dice than that meme, or about the same? <laughs> we are going for less uh, as as much as it, it I uh, I love those my Warhammer days of you know shaking a giant fist full of dice uh, but uh, generally uh, when you play diesel you'll be rolling somewhere between five to eight dice in in most cases uh, and with most of it being on the lower and taking that into account um Whenever, whenever somebody whenever somebody says that they use say a D six system or a D ten system or or a D or something like that, um, you, they usually end up falling into one into one of two categories, which I like to call um, sum based and hit based. Mm -hmm. um, sum based, a good example of that would be say Star Wars D six. Mm -hmm. Where you're ro you're rolling the die, but it's more about the sum total of the result. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, something like Shadowrun or World of Darkness would be hit based, where you're lo where you're looking for a number of um, die over a thre over a certain threshold. Mm -hmm. Some call it hits, some call it successes, but the but all roads still lead to Rome. Um, yep. Which end of the spectrum it does the diesel engine fall into? Diesel uses the success, uh, so anything in Diesel, a, a 4, 5, or 6 mm -hmm. is a success, so you roll all your dice and anything 4, 5, or 6 counts as a success, and your number of successes is balanced against the, the DC of whatever you're doing. And what, what would be the, what would be the um, baseline DC? Uh, for a, a, a fairly average thing, it's, it's probably like 2 mm -hmm. or 3. Uh, is is most things, but diesel is built to encourage you to try for the the hard things. <laughs> so we introduce the an overclock system. Mm -hmm. So every character has mods. Uh, you have you know robotic parts built into you, mm -hmm. and any roll that you do that uses those mods, you can overclock the mods and uh, add additional dice. But each of those dice gives you a higher chance of malfunctioning. So you can uh, get yourself a very large die pool in some instances mm -hmm. uh, and you know accomplish some incredibly difficult things. But uh, you might break yourself doing it. Would it be fair to say that the overclock system is Diesel's answer to a, um extra effort mechanic? Uh, essentially. It's... Diesel is very much built for rule of cool uh, and just like we want it to be an action movie. So, you know, <laughs> like, uh, uh, you know, in, in playtesting, uh, a character leapt up and launched themselves off the wall behind them uh, and leapt off several tables to make their way all the way across a room and uh, stab an enemy while they were shooting at them uh, and pin them to the wall. And all of that was one turn, it, you know, like something like that's just not really possible in, in more stringent rule systems. So we really wanted it to have that flexibility of you can, you're encouraged to try and do pretty much anything you can think of. Mm -hmm. And give now, given, given that, given that, I'd like to go. I'd like to go a little bit more into the um co to the concept of overclock and uh, mal and uh, malfun and malfunction. Um, now, the way you describe it, the the thing that immediately came to mind is 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 something akin to glitches in um, Shadowrun. And I know what I know. I've referenced Shadowrun a, a handful mm -hmm. of times, but um, it it. it it's, <laughs> but for 
for a lot of for, for a lot of people when it comes to a d6 pool with a whole lot of customization that's where the die is going to lay if you'll far, mm -hmm. if you'll pardon the pun but would it be in that setup um there there can sometimes be a but result if um a role has a certain number of ones yep. is mal is um is overclocking and malfunctioning on a similar uh, paradigm and if not how how would it um differ it's it's definitely similar uh, and shadow runs a, a fair comparison uh, that was that was something we looked at that was in our, our earliest discussions of shadow run was was doing a lot of right things uh, mm -hmm. we ended up paring it down and making it simpler and more streamlined uh, but there there is a lot of purposeful connection there uh, so yeah definitely overclocking and malfunctions uh, fall into that so whenever you are so you can get a malfunction several ways. You can get it from overclocking, uh, or if you take damage to your metallic parts, um, you can get malfunctions, and that adds uh, uh, or changes some of your dice in the pool to malfunction dice. And if any of your malfunction dice roll a one, then something goes wrong. Uh, and it's entirely up to the GM's discretion, uh, and it generally doesn't cause the action to fail. So, you know, it's it's very much the game is built on fail forward, where yes, yeah, something went wrong. It doesn't mean that thing failed, but uh, you know, for instance, I had a player who wanted to leap from car to car in a car chase, and they have um, they had mechanical legs that would enable them to do something like that fairly easily, but they wanted to really slam it home, and they overclocked and malfunctioned. Uh, and there's all sorts of things you can do with that. You know, maybe they overshoot, and uh, instead of landing on the hood of the car, they're dangling from uh, uh, the door, or they're stuck on the roof, uh, or they're in an opportune place, uh, and they, you know now they're more vulnerable to gunfire. Or maybe their legs are stuck in that turbocharged mode, where now every move they make is supercharged. <laughs> you know, there's there's all sorts of things that can go wrong, whatever narratively is interesting. Yeah. But uh, something can go wrong. Now, give... And, pro and probably will, because as the mantra goes here in the temple, the dice gods show no mercy. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, when I look at the base stats, um, the... The majority of them are are um, about what about what I'd expect. The one that I'm curious about, and and would cu and be curious about th some of the uh, details on it is organics and specifically mm -hmm. its uh, relationship with meat and metal. Now, yep. if I, now if I'm now if I've got it if I've got it down pat correctly, the um the larger amount of um the the larger the lower the organ. It says the lower organic score, the more uh, slots that you have for um, mods. Now, what I'm curious about is the is how is how the difference between meat and metal ends up working in context, and what would be the benefits and drawbacks to somebody having a high low in either. Yeah, the uh, so organics came about because we we very purposely wanted to avoid the cyberpunk trope of uh, and this this is something that we wanted to move away from Shadowrun with, uh, where we wanted to avoid the idea that getting modifications loses your humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's a lot of problems with that, so we uh, wanted to move away, and we introduced organics uh, as a measure of how much of you is metal. And essentially, the more when you take damage, you can choose to take damage to either your metal or your meat, and when you take damage to metal, you get malfunctions, but if you run out of meat, you die. So it's very much your choice. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's functionally the same amount of health. You know, it always adds up to six, um, but it, it very much changes, and you have to think about your priorities. Because, you know, some players have two metal and four meat, and they'll take the, the the hit to their meat and keep their mods functioning, but they get <laughs> closer to dying. And some players are uh, almost entirely metal, and uh, they, they end up 
malfunctioning more and more because they are f more fragile in that way. Uh, but their, you know, physical self is protected and it's easier to repair metal than it is meat because you can find a new, you know, servo motor and plug it in, but you can't find a new rib and replace yours, you know. I I know you I know you said that you wanted to move away from from uh, the from the humanity mm -hmm. well, I would say humanity but that's a Cyberpunk 2020 thing in um sh in Shadowrun mm -hmm. it was essence which yeah um I tol I will admit I tolerated essence because I realized it was a means to keep people from going um Cybernex and going with magic yeah well, their their magic mechanic which we don't have mm -hmm. helped help their system like, yeah. make sense in that way um but some something else that I'm, cu I'm curious if you given the way you talked about um taking damage is is would it be would it be fair to say that your that damage works more on a um hit point approach rather than a wound approach the difference being that um with the latter you tend to have a escalating series of um of all action penalties mm -hmm. um the damage track and sh the damage track and say shadow run or um, world of darkness are prime examples of a wound system in this case mm -hmm. um but would but would that kind of thing be a f be a factor or is that mainly relegated to um to malfunctions uh definitely uh we we wanted it to hurt mm -hmm. if you got hit uh so very like the the actual damage to your meat and metal is lasting it's mm -hmm. it's intended to be it to take time to repair and heal um it's you know like you get shot like you have a bullet wound <laughs> like that hurts really badly mm -hmm. uh which is why we have uh guard uh so when you get hit the first thing you lose is guard mm -hmm. uh, and guard is that you know your ability to dodge or block or you know deflect damage in some way uh, and it's eventually, you know, your shield arm gets tired, your guard goes away, and finally the important hits start getting. And guard resets after every combat, but your meat and metal don't. So hopefully, you know, you can you can dodge out of the way just enough times to get through the fight, but if the fight keeps going, eventually your luck's going to run out and you're going to take some serious damage. All right. And, um, when... Now, I will I I will admit when I looked at the uh, mod section in the quick in the quick play um, mm -hmm. document, um, something I did something I did I did find um, that I did find that I appreciated is the sense that, and I'm pretty and I'm guessing this will be um, this will care this will carry over into the full book. Mm -hmm. Mods are categorized based on overall um, theme, more than anything else. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, and I'm guessing, I'm guessing that's to gu guide people based on um based on what sort of role they pr they prefer leaning towards. Yeah, diesel is a is a classless system, mm -hmm. so you can have any combination of mods. Um, you can have you know one from each category, whatever you want. Uh, but we put the mods themselves into classes, and narratively, that's you know, like the, the, these mods are constructed, you know, they're, they're built by a company for a reason, you know, that, so they each have like a, a category that they fall into. Um, but, uh, functionally you can take any combination of whatever you want, but it does help kind of figure it out. So there's like flinger mods, which is range DPS, you know, slicer mods are melee DPS. So you, you know, like everything has, a sort of category that it, it generally falls into. So you mm -hmm. can say, oh, I'm just going to do charger mods, and you can really spec yourself out to be a, a great charger. Or, you know, you can take a little bit of everything and be kind of a jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. Speaking of character creation, that ties into something that I wanted to ask. Um, a lot of classless games, ha and uh, even the ones that I like, have a bit have a bit of a bit of a on off issue with choice paralysis because in a lot mm -hmm. of cases and I'm pretty sure you've seen this as well as well as I have 
character creation amounts to giving you a set a set of points for everything and just and just pushing you into the deep end of the pool and saying swim damn it mm -hmm. um <laughs> Now, obviously, you can, obviously trying to eliminate choice paralysis completely in this kind of setup is impossible. But what in what ways do you guys plan on on at least minimizing or or um, put or putting a putting a bit of a lasso around the around this sort of um, choice paralysis? Yeah, that's definitely something that was a concern to me, and. Uh, the i think we we limited the amount of mods in the game uh as one step because we could you could do mods all day mm -hmm. <laughs> you know you could make thousands of mods uh and one of our stretch goals is is more mods uh, and i would love to hit that because we do have some really great ideas but uh we we kept it to kind of the basic uh, uh and, and a, few, a few interesting ones but <laughs> uh, mostly the the basic mods uh, to try to speed that along, yeah. um, because but also Diesel is intended for you to have a session zero where you collaboratively build your characters with the other players, mm -hmm. um, and I think having that kind of freedom and time is very useful uh, because it's not like you're sitting down. And it's like, hey, throw something together. We're gonna play in ten minutes. You're figuring out your characters, and you start figuring out who is this person, why are they here, what are they doing, and you have that freedom. You know, you're not locked into your mods because you're in a session zero. So if you you think, oh, I want A, B, and C, and then you're talking to someone, and you realize, oh, maybe F sounds cool. You know, like you can build that character and, and have that freedom uh, until you actually finish the session zero and lock it in. Mm -hmm. And Given, given the whole, um, given the fact that you brought up session zero, something I'm, I'm curious about in that regard is, do you, do you see, um, do you see Diesel as the as the kind of game that would bent that would, lean more towards, um, more towards long form multi session campaigns, or do you see it as some as something that could handle um, one shots just as well? Diesel is built for the short game, more than anything. It's uh, it can handle long games if that's what you want, mm -hmm. but uh, it's intended for the action movie. Yeah. You know the the one story of the one incredible thing that this group of people did. So like when you get together in the session zero, you build your characters and you also collabor collaboratively build what they're doing. So the GM ultimately designs the game but you, you together kind of decide the bones of it. And it's it's intended to just be this one quick, impactful game. So it could be a one-shot, mm -hmm. or it could be, you know, I think somewhere between, like, two to five sessions is, is the golden zone. Um, but you absolutely could play it longer, and I would love to see someone do, like, a year-long diesel campaign. I think it would be incredible. And the tools are there if you want them. But the most of Diesel is built to encourage a short, impactful explosion of the game. Yep. Now, some something that it, something that I found a bit interesting when it came to how you how you guys have set up um, combat is instead instead of utilizing successes for determining initiative, you 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 utilize the um, sum. Um, mm -hmm. Now, now I can, I can, I have my guesses as to why this was done, but I'm curious as to your take. Was this something that you always had, you always had planned for, or was it something that kind of developed beca because of things that had happened during playtesting? Uh, it it did change in playtesting. It was originally successes, just like every other role, and when we changed it, there was a, a fair amount of discussion within the team because it's the one time we break that rule, mm -hmm. uh, which. You know, that's always strange to do that. Um, but we did find in testing that there's a lot of overlap. You know, like a lot of players get two, a lot get three. It, you know, it it made it difficult to have order to it because there was a significant amount of overlap. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, had, we saw some other D6 pool systems um, 
you know, I kind of keep an eye on <laughs> what everyone else is doing. And we saw some of them move in, in this direction where they, they did the sum. Uh, and I thought that was a really elegant way to fix it, even though it, it broke the rule. Uh, and I, I tested it and I, as the GM, liked it a lot more, even though it broke the rule. So we, we ended up moving with it. Now, when it comes now, um, when it came to when it comes when it comes to um, when it comes to defense in co in combat, I'm guessing that I'm guessing that when mitigating damage, damage goes to guard first, then to armor, then to um, either meat either meat or metal. Uh, armor doesn't take any damage. Armor is how hard it is to hit you. Surely. All right, so we get we've got the we've got the good old AC principle. Essentially, so if if so, when I attack an enemy, let's say, uh, and I roll just a punch, that would just be brawn, and I have three brawn, so I roll three dice. I have to beat or meet their armor. Mm -hmm. So if I roll two successes and they have two armor, I hit them, and then I deal damage based on my weapon. So in this case, my hand, you know. Uh, and it's the same thing with a, a shotgun. You know, if I fire the shotgun, I roll whatever my dice are. If I meet or exceed their armor, then I'm going to deal shotgun damage, which obviously would be <laughs> a lot more than the hand. And they take that damage to their guard. And once their guard is expended, uh, then they choose to take it to meat or metal. And eventually everything gets expended <laughs> until you get down to uh, dead. And... When it comes when it comes to determining whether or not damage goes to meat or metal, is mm -hmm. it a case where it's all got to go to one or the other, or is there the possibility that somebody could split it? Nope, it all goes to one or the other. Uh, but if it's you know, so if I have two metal and I take four damage, then the rest carries over into meat. Uh, but you have to you have to take it all to one in, in the first case. All right, and um, given. Given the way com given the way uh, the combat section is written in the document, um, would it be fair of me to say that this is that this is a, a system that leans more towards um, theater of the mind than full than full on grid? Very much. Uh, I I definitely encourage theater theater of the mind for this uh, because I I use the word cinematic a lot for Diesel and and I think that's the best way to experience it. Uh, you know, I, I love D and D, and I use use grids and and maps when I play D and D, uh, and that sort of strategy element can be very important. Um, but in Diesel, you know, you're not measuring out how far away you are for your spells, or you know what exactly is within a 15 foot cone. It's you know you can move a reasonable amount and do a reasonable amount of things, <laughs> you know, and that's, it's in, intended for it to be very player focused and very fun focused, uh, where it, it enables things like doing crazy backflips and leaping off stuff and, you know, doing cool guy, you know, like rapid fire gunshots, you know, and, and that's not all individually in the rules because the GM is empowered to, modify dcs or to say or to stop you know and say okay well that's you know now you're going a little bit too much <laughs> you know uh and that's where you can overclock if you really want to push yourself for something or you know just take it to another turn uh, yeah. but it's meant to be very flexible now the way that the way that you've described the set the setting of diesel with um with the with edge and uh, the and the frontier um, would it be fair to say that you guys are leaning towards more of a um, more of a sandbox style of des of designing your setup? Because when I looked at the way the frontier was described, it's it seemed to it seemed to have a um, back door to allow for just about anything to show up in the frontier if if someone wanted to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very very explicitly. Uh, a lot is left up to the GM because uh, this isn't. We didn't want to give homework, you know, like I, I don't want to pass out pamphlets to all my players and be like, okay, learn this setting, make sure you fit into it. No, like the, there's a place for that. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, in this instance, with this sort of fast paced, flexible game, 
we designed the setting as guide rails. So there's plenty of information, there's plenty of definition of the towns, there's important NPCs, there's all sorts of stuff about how everything functions. And that's to provide a shared base for everyone. But there's so much flexibility built into that. You know, like it's not actually important who the mayor of such and such town is. I might have put that NPC in there. But if a player comes in and says, oh, hey, I was thinking it would be cool if I was the mayor of the town. Okay, mm -hmm. awesome. <laughs> like, it doesn't actually matter that that NPC exists already because yeah. we want players to be able to flex. And that is exactly, like you said, reflected heavily in the frontier, which is the space between universes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's outside reality, and that's a space where anything can exist, which means everything exists, <laughs> you know? I will ad I will admit that there were t there were there were two ki there were two kinds of um, visualizations that kept that kept coming up in in my uh, mind when I with the way the frontier was described. One of them is the really weird, sur almost surrealist kind of um, kind of fantasy art that you would see in a lot a lot of a lot of pulp stories, especially especially from the pages of um, weird tales. Mm -hmm. um, the as well, and the other is some of the some of the bizarre um, cover art that you might see for say a for say a um, prog rock album. <laughs> um, the sword and the sword, especially warp riders, especially came to mind. Um. <laughs> it's it's interesting that everyone I've talked to about the frontier has a wildly different interpretation mm -hmm. of what it looks like, and I think that's excellent. I think that's the point. It, that is absolutely nothing like I imagine the frontier, <laughs> you know, but that doesn't mean it's any less valid because yeah. that's how the frontier works. And I know, I know that you, I know that you, um, com that you composed your, you composed the, um, music for, music for your interpretation of it. I will, I will admit that, um, when I think of the music that I'd use as cues for people going into the frontier, um, the composer I keep thinking of is um, Philip Glass, especially the stuff that he did for the Katsi trilogy. Uh, I did not compose music for the Frontier. Oh, oh so, so it's, I got thrown off by the whole composed by St composed by Stephen. But when I think of musical cues for for the Frontier, that's what that's what comes to mind. Yeah, I th I think of the Frontier as like liquid. So yeah. when I think of musical cues, I think of like very distorted, like distant, echoey sort of thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. But oh. that, uh, you know, it's so different. I love that. Oh, gl glass, glass. What traditionally is a p traditionally is a pianist, but he was not afraid to put in um, more elect more synth elements into his work, and that's the reason mm -hmm. why I bring up the uh, Katsi trilogy. It's yeah. uh, it's an interesting listen if you ever get the chance. But I'll check it out. Yeah. Give, but given given that, and I know I know you mentioned that this lean that you're leaning for theater of the mind, but could but could you could you see um the frontier being used in kind in kind of a in kind of a hex crawl like setup? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's not an environment that people are supposed to be in. <laughs> it's it's definitely you're encouraged to go there because it's neat mm -hmm. but it's a place that's it's meant to be uncomfortable and slowly deadly so like it's in in the world of diesel it's people's job to go out there there's these very valuable crystals that form on its border but uh it, it's a terrible job <laughs> you know it, it taxes you and one well, uh, a lot of the residents in this world uh who can like they, they live near this veil outside of reality and it's it's an oppressive feeling it's it's a difficult feeling uh you know there's a lot of struggle with depression and anxiety because you're this this wall of the infinite is always in your vision uh so it's it's definitely not meant to be a good place but that does not at all mean that you might not go out there and blow up some crazy aliens. That sounds great. <laughs> and given given the given that given that sort of feel that you're going for, do you have is there is there a set of um suggestions in ter in terms of 
demonstrating the effects that being that being in frontier can have the deeper you go in nope uh <laughs> we, that's that's the sort of stuff that we leave up to the gm uh because it's it, you know, i don't want to be referencing charts and figuring out stuff uh and it it takes up space that might not be necessary you know so most games aren't going to venture super far outside reality uh, so why take up a bunch of space giving specific rules about it when instead I can just empower the GM to say, yeah, whatever you think is out there, whatever you think the effect should be, go for it. You know, I can define it's probably not a very good place, <laughs> but if you want to give your players some sort of super visor that, that protects them from its effects, and lets them go out on like this deep space mission to fight, uh, you know, mirror versions of themselves. Hey, that sounds like a really fun time. Do it. Yeah, the um, I will admit one of the reasons I ended up having that kind of thinking is because um, I ended up remembering the the some of the um, campaigns that I would do for Legend of the Five Rings, involving mm -hmm. the Shadowlands, where. They were get where um they were given a f or the players were given a finger of jade to protect themselves from its effects, but mm -hmm. that finger only lasts for a set amount of time. Mm -hmm. So they've got to try and get all the in all the info and all the all the dirt that they can, and then get out without yeah. without risking too without risking too much of it. Um, I suppose in, I suppose in a way that kind of approach is a precursor to things like Darkest Dungeon. You know, where where it's a matter of how how much deeper are you are you willing to go, are you willing to go, and how mm -hmm. far, how far are you willing to uh, get close to that cliff before hitting the brakes in a game of chicken? <laughs> yes, uh, and you can absolutely play that sort of game mm -hmm. in Diesel. But give, given that, and I know you're I know you're shooting for a very light book, um, stretch goals notwithstanding. But do you have plans to put in? A um, a few sam a few sample adversaries in in a kind of micro bestiary. We do. Uh, it's our last stretch goal. Um, in in the game, and this this is in the quick play rules too. We we've, we've just defined minion, lieutenant, and boss. You know, each one that gets progressively harder. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those are functionally the only things you need because minions never really last long enough. You're you're chewing them down. The lieutenants give you a little bit of pause. A boss comes out, and then you're like, "Okay, now we're paying." All right. Uh, and obviously, you could build just like a player, you know, an, an ultimate enemy diesel that's uh, you know super powerful. Um, but you know, really, you have like one of those a game, <laughs> you know, like the the, the big boss, um, and everything else you just kind of chew through. So we didn't bother statting out a bunch of stuff, but we did have an idea while we were talking through stretch goals. Uh, to create an, an enemy compendium of some of these big bosses, uh, you know, just that have interesting, unique abilities or, you know, special uh, ways they can use their things or, you know, huge amounts of health, whatever it is, um, that would be at least great inspiration points, even if you don't want to use them directly in your game. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we do have plans for it, and hopefully we, we hit that stretch goal. So in the at in lieu of jinxing you, <laughs> just got to make sure because you know you should know as well as I as well as I do how um how thick how fickle Lady Luck is. Yep. Um. And g given given that given that brief um that brief si that brief size with. Um. Even with even with that, do you? The other thing, the other thing I was curious about is on um is when it comes to malfunctions. You did now, when you talked about it earlier, you had mentioned that the effects of malfunctions are left up to the GM. But do you plan on putting it aside to give to give to give um examples on what on what malfunctions might look like? Yes, we we do have a couple examples in there. Pretty much everything that's that we we leave up to the GM, we at least give examples uh, to to give people so, you know a base to 
to yeah. to jump off of at least for their their first couple of times mm-hmm. uh, but uh, you know we we encourage gms to uh, because every diesel is unique and every game is unique you know your circumstances are going to be way different than anything we plan for uh, so we encourage gms to uh, like do whatever is narratively cool in the moment mm-hmm you did you did say that you did say that um that you guys are you guys are leaning a lot more t- a lot more towards rule of cool when it comes to mm-hmm. when it comes to the approach and gi- given that mad max is one of you, is cited as one of your inspirations i can definitely see that yep. um even even if there's even if there's no way i'm making a character who's walking around in chaps <laughs> like, how how Lord how Lord Humongous does does that? I'll have no idea. <laughs> um, but when it comes to mods, something that I'm something that I'm curious about because inevitably, someone's going someone's going to posit their own um their own custom mods for well mods. Mm-hmm. What what would you say is the baseline for when it comes to, or not baseline but rather suggestions for how for how many slots a given mod should take like how powerful how powerful do you see a two slot versus a four slot or, e- or even more than four we actually do have a whole section in the book for designing mods mm-hmm. uh, because of exactly what you said you know people are going to come to their their own ideas uh, and actually i was i was very impressed i saw this in action uh we had a, a live play uh, of diesel that was run uh, by the Majestic Goose Network on Twitch, and their character came, or one of their players came to the table and said, "Hey, I want to turn into a car." <laughs> like he he was a a semi organic transformer, and the the GM just pulled up the rules on designing mods and was able to very quickly just do that and roll with it. And I was I was very proud that that happened. Uh, cause we have essentially, we, we have a rubric in the book, mm-hmm. um, that kind of breaks down, um, you know, like, uh, uh, a minor effect, you know, something small is, is one, one cost, um, all the way up to, uh, um, uh, you know, like the calculating how much dice bonuses things are giving you, uh, or how much adding, guard or meat or metal is worth or integrating weapons um and you could build a mod that that does all these things that is a super laser rocket gun that gives you armor and calls your mom and (laughs) using this rubric you can just count that up and be like okay that would cost you know five slots Mm -hmm. Uh, and you can just work with that yeah and I'm I'm still I'm, I still got thrown for a loop for for the fact that somebody wanted to do the whole turn into a car, turn into yeah. a car and I'm get I'm guessing in that case they um they en- they ended up sta- they ended up statting out well the 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 diff- the stats for both modes which does bring me to an interesting thing mm-hmm. given given the fact that you get that you guys are doing a um you guys are aiming for ru- you guys are aiming for rule of cool mm-hmm. um. And are aiming for a very simplistic approach. I know, I know that attributes have already been established, but is this game going to be utilizing a um, skill system, or is that, or is that not in the cards? Uh, not specifically. Uh, it's just your your base stats plus your mods. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know you have the the six base stats, which for anyone hasn't seen it, is brawn, dexterity, personality, mechanics, know-how, and organics. So organic doesn't get used as, as a skill. Um, and something like know-how is very broad. You know, that's just your general kind of intelligence. Um, and it's kind of just whatever is applicable, plus any of your mods that might be applicable that give some kind of bonus to mm-hmm. it. Um, and you know, again, it's it's all built for that flexibility. Uh, you know, where if you say, "Hey, I, I want to see if this guy's lying to me," okay, well, that's probably a personality check. But if you say, "I want to see if this guy's lying to me," and I want to use my uh, cool robot eye to 
watch his temperature fluctuations or check his heart rate, well, okay, now you're, you, you know, now let's make a personality check, but we're going to add in the extra dice from the, that mod that you're using. And now we're, we're going to bump that up, you know, mm-hmm. and that's, that kind of flexibility just gets restrained by a skill, a skill tree. Yeah. Now, when it comes to, when it comes, when it comes to games that utilize um, melee and ranged weapons, mm-hmm. um, a conundrum that I often see is making it so that bo- so that neither one gets out sh- gets outshined by the other, unless unless it's trying to go for that le- that level of grit. Mm-hmm. Given th- given that, um, what did what did what sort of trade offs could could you could you foresee in a system like this so so that you don't so you don't have it where it becomes too advantageous to to not have everybody just use firearms. Yeah, it's definitely a game that encourages firearms. Uh, <laughs> but in every game I've played, someone has wanted to just be a brawler. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's fantastic. Um, and we have mods that support both, uh, first of all. Um, and your base stats end up being largely flat in that your organic score caps your other stats. So if you're more and more mechanical, your organics goes down and down, which means all your other stats go down with it. So if you have an organics of four, your max highest stat is four. If you have an organics of two, your max highest stat is two, and all your other stats get squished down with it. And what that does is the more mods you add, the more specialized you get. So if you want to build yourself to be a brawler, you can slot all the mods you want to be tough and fast and have metal fists with rockets in them. Mm-hmm. It, you know, you can build all these things and then you're specialized to do that. And someone else can be specialized to shoot a gun and functionally you, you generally balance out. And then it's up to the GM to ensure that both are given equal opportunity Mm-hmm. You know, if you have a player that's a brawler and your whole adventure is set, you know, on a car chase, that's going to be harder for them. But that's, you know, that's on the GM to make sure that everyone's given a, an opportunity to shine. Yeah. Plus, w- plus, obviously, with people who have the have mods, there's the um, there's the elephant in the room that is the option to overclock. Mm-hmm. And when, given the fact that it it talks about how ha- with the overclocking rules, it talks about a maximum of um, th- of three die mm-hmm. that that can be added. Um, was that was that a num- what was that a number that you ha- that you had to nail down during um, play testing? That one wasn't actually. That was straight from uh, our designer. Uh, we have a, a, a designer Matthew who was mm-hmm. the co-designer of the diesel engine, uh, who is excellent at game math, uh, you know, doing spreadsheets and calculating the odds of things and percentages and, and what each die actually adds to the chances of things and all that. So uh, he knew uh, when he designed that system, I, I believe he had that cap in there and it, it tested excellently. It tested just right. So uh, that was pure math. Yeah. And, I'm guess I'm guessing that when it comes to ranged weapons, given how um, given how loose this game is playing, um, you're not all that concerned about um, ammo. No. <laughs> uh, you know, again, if that's the kind of game you want to play, you absolutely can. There, there's nothing stopping. You. Uh, but the the game as it is is kind of engineered to not super matter. <laughs> it's it's the same sort of thing. Like there's there's a section in the book about uh the economy mm-hmm. of, of this of this world and the, sh- the short of it is it doesn't really matter you know the, the players go in uh, like during character creation you should have a general idea of how affluent or not affluent a character is so if they walk into a shop and say hey can i get a drink okay yeah i don't i'm not gonna check to make sure you have two dollars in your pocket but if they walk in and say hey can i have that custom souped up supercar well, then it's a question of, you know, do you, could you actually afford that? And then that's a, a problem. 
Um, but stuff like that, the, the kind of minutia of the world doesn't really matter. It's not something we really concerned ourselves with. Although I, I think in a I think in a case like that with the souped up car, with the souped up car you could have you could have all the you could have all the cash in the world but it's not going to matter for anything if they're not selling, right? <laughs> and then how do you get the car? There's an adventure. Um. Although, per, never mind the fact that, and I've and I've and I can I can say this because I've actually done this. Somebody try somebody um. Somebody tried to st somebody tried to steal the artifact that was that was on the shelf that they couldn't afford, and they mm -hmm. technically stole it. But um, they they forgot to they forgot to check the tag and fi and figure out why there was a why there was a mysterious beeping noise afterwards. <laughs> yes, that's amazing. Is you don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about that artifact getting stolen if there is no artifact. <laughs> um. Look, check check for traps, people. <laughs> but but one one avenue that I'm that I'm curious about, especially give especially given some of the uh, motifs within within a within a Western or a Western adjacent like space westerns and the like, is um not is combat that doesn't involve on the ground, you know, ve vehicle mm -hmm. combat and the like. Is that something that you guys have cons have considered? Yeah, we, uh, and, and it was actually added in our, our first playtest. Our first playtest had a, a week break between part one and part two. Mm -hmm. And uh, we set up part one, and I was like, oh, wait, that, that I got to do a cool car chase out of this thing. Like, I, I, I absolutely need a cool chase sequence. Uh, and during that week, the, <laughs> the designers went in and made vehicle rules uh, because the, it's the sort of game that lends itself well to vehicle chases and car explosions and all that stuff uh so we we made vehicle rules and i tested them uh in that very next play test uh, and we, it was actually one of the most revised sections in the whole book because we had to kind of figure out what felt right uh but i think we ended up with a a, a nice system and, and it is in the in the book there's a whole section on chases and how to track it there's vehicle malfunctions there's ramming uh, and upgrading and customizing your vehicles and we define like the basic enemies we define a, a few basic vehicle types uh, with some basic stats to help you keep track of uh, their malfunctions and their speed and all that yeah and well of course of course you had to have a vehicle chase because that's the un that's the unwritten rule when it comes to a mad max movie you've got to have some sort of big elaborate ve vehicle stunt yeah it was the one thing where like I realized we didn't have it, and it was the one thing where I was like, "Oh, oh, what a terrible oversight! <laughs> we need to do that." <laughs> um, but given all given all that, what would what would you say were some of the big takeaway lessons that you had learned during um play testing? Um, more vehicle rules, obviously. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh honestly, play testing went. A lot as expected, which is is that you know I'm I'm a fairly experienced GM, mm -hmm. uh, so and I, I've written a lot of RPG content in the past, so I, I already knew to plan for players, <laughs> you know, doing doing whatever they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so we already had a lot of that built in, um, and I think a lot of the engine, the actual mechanics of this were very tight. Like we, we refined a lot, especially with the vehicles and with the enemy stats to make sure that that all felt right. And we, we tuned in some of the mods to make them feel balanced or to, you know, like there were a couple instances where players were doing things that the mods weren't built to do, mm -hmm. but it kept happening where so it was like oh obviously this is <laughs> you know like we we should adapt this mod uh to figure out how it works the way players think that it works um but i think uh, more of the changes came in the narrative side where it was just we learned a lot about how players don't need that detail you know i don't need to write up the details of everything because the players were just filling it in and rolling with it themselves you know 
All right, I I I got you. Now you get now you guys you guys launched a few days ago and your and your go your um goal end is at the at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. Um now presuming everything goes as planned, which is why I knocked on wood earlier. What would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Are you thinking fall? Uh, the writing is done, which is fantastic. But the the whole book is written and edited, uh, except for stretch goal content. So if we do manage to hit that, that'll take a, a little bit. But we're all ready, and we've cleared our schedules for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so all that's immediately left to do, if we just hit minimum funding, is to finish the layout uh, and. Uh, the quick play rules have established the format and the style already. Mm -hmm. So we have to go in and just follow that template and put it in. But what's going to take some time is sourcing art and uh, the actual printing process. So when the whole book is done, we have to send it for approval and then we get a test copy and make sure that's good. And we have to wait for that to ship. And then we, you know, like it just takes a while Uh so like after we put our stamp on it and say yes good done it takes like a full month just to test it and approve it and make sure the the book itself is good before we can send it out to customers mm -hmm. so with all that in mind assuming we be fund we're looking at a late summer delivery uh somewhere in july to august probably if everything goes all right with art well if it, com oh, if it comes right around august i can make plenty of birthday jokes on my on my behalf <laughs> I would love to get it to you for your birthday. <laughs> yeah. Um. But with and I'll I'll certainly be keeping an eye, keeping an eye on what sort on what sort of craziness comes comes out of the um pot, comes out of the pipeline in the in the process. Um. With that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to mm -hmm. come up to the temple and enjoy the insanity at play here. Absolutely. And thank you for having me on. This was fun. Yep. Anytime you see fit to return, whether it whether it's for more diesel or just for shit posting, the <laughs> door is always open. Cause, well, so I need some. Cause there's always there's always more reasons to pick on the bard. <laughs> <laughs> As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Excellent. Thank you for having me. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on and enjoy the show. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!